morning is about experiencing the sacred through the ordinary. I would like to share a story from my 19th summer. In 1961, my first real job away from home was as a counselor at a camp in the Adirondack Mountains. The camp provided two-week vacations for girls from the poorest sections of New York City. I was an only child from a suburban neighborhood on the fringes of Erie, Pennsylvania. The girls and I experienced culture shock together. Every two weeks that summer, busloads of campers in successive age groups arrived into a totally alien environment far from home. I was in charge of the lake's waterfront and a cabin of 12 girls. The camp provided simple, healthy food, and the girls drank so much milk that it seemed they could not be filled. The food was often unfamiliar to them. Potatoes went over well, not so much vegetables. Casseroles were met with deep suspicion. <laughs> they were required to ask for the serving dishes to be passed for seconds. And if it went past another person at the table who wanted some too, she had to ask permission from the original requester a totally foreign concept. The girls all were homesick and a little afraid. They experienced the woods as dark and full of strange noises. They had never been somewhere so absolutely dark at night and wanted company to venture from the cabins to the latrines. They fought to hold my hands at the evening campfires. Hardly any of them knew how to swim. The week the oldest campers arrived, the 13-year-olds, was the most heartbreaking. The toughest girl in my cabin threatened to stab the others to keep them away from her bed and her things, and they believed her. I am sorry to say that I privately went through her things while she was out of the cabin to look for a weapon which she did not have. We talked a lot. In conversation, she told me that she was the only girl on her block at home who had not had a baby yet. We both cried when she boarded the bus to return to the city. I was not aware of it happening, but when someone asked me after the summer was over whether a specific camper was black or white, I had to pause to recall the face in order to answer. That was the summer that my heart went colorblind. Richard Linkletter is the director of such contemporary cinema classics as Dazed and Confused, about the last day of a high school in, 19, in the 1970s, School of Rock, starring Jack Black, and the Before Trilogy, starring Ethan Hawke and Julie Delphi. Now to see who's in my audience this morning, who has seen Dazed and Confused? All right, School of Rock? All right. The Before Trilogy, any of them? Anybody? All right. Okay, one? Good, good. You're hidden in the sunlight. <laughs> of, those, uh, of those films, the Before Trilogy is where we first begin to see Linklater's willingness to risk playing the long game. Before Sunrise came out in 1995. It's about a young American man, Jesse, and a young French woman, Celine. They meet randomly and spend one night together talking as they walk through the city of Vienna. The only time they have together, as the film's title tells us, is before sunrise. Now here's the twist. The next two installments, before sunset in 2004 and before midnight in 2013, were filmed and released at nine-year intervals each, a total of an 18-year span. With the same two actors, themselves of course, literally nine years older, playing the same characters nine years later, and with the details of the plot influenced by everyone's actual life experience during the intervening nine years. And barring any unforeseen tragedies in the lives of Linklater, um, Hawk, or Delphi, I suspect we may see a fourth installment in the Before series sometime around 2022. In the meantime, if you haven't seen the first three, I recommend them. The point is that Linklater, as a director, is deeply interested in coming of age, both as a teenager and as an adult. 
He's very interested in ordinary life and how we are all swept up inevitably, inexorably, in the flow of time. And although I'm a big fan of the Before Trilogy, this summer Linklater released the film Boyhood. Now, how many of you have seen Boyhood? Okay, just one. I'm not, it hasn't come to Frederick, right? You can actually drive about 45 minutes to see it. It's still in theaters, but you really have to go out of your way. Uh, so it's received, uh, to this date, his greatest critical acclaim. And again, we see Linklater taking a risk on playing the long game. In 2002, two years prior to filming the second installment of the Before series, Linklater cast a six-year-old. Now that's a risk, right? Casting a six-year-old that you plan on working with every year for the next 12 years, as he did for this film, Boyhood. So he cast um, a young boy named Eller Coltrane to play the character of Mason. And it was originally called 12 Years, but they had to change it to Boyhood because of a little film that came out called 12 Years a Slave that won a lot of attention uh, in 2013. Linklater's achievement is a powerful example of that old saying, we often, almost daily, overestimate what we can get done in any single day but we often underestimate what we could accomplish in a decade. The cast came together once a year for 12 years to create a film who, like the before series, whose plot evolved organically over time out of the life experience of the actual team coming together to film. And the film itself is simply those 12 segments filmed once a year, stitched together, showing annual scenes from Mason's life from the first grade through his first day at college. And as with the Before Trilogy, what's fascinating about Boyhood is that it is a profound artistic and spiritual meditation on the passage of time. As the writer of Ecclesiastes says, time and chance happen to us all. And Linklater cast his own young daughter as the co-star, so he was pretty sure uh, that Coltrane's parents were on board with this 12-year project, but he definitely knew where his daughter was going to be for the next 12 summers, since she was still a minor. But as she became a teenager, she actually got tired of doing this every summer and actually said, Dad, can my character, like, die? <laughs> to which Linklater replied, honey, that would be a little dramatic for this film. Because to me, and that points to the heart of this film's brilliance. Boyhood is much less about any major train wreck experience, though that certainly happens in our lives sometimes. But there are plenty of movies that cram an incredible amount into two hours. But Boyhood is more about the travails and the triumphs of the everyday. Coming of age, parenting, surviving adulthood. And this morning, I want to invite us to reflect on the spirituality of the ordinary. It's no coincidence that another of Linklater's long-term future projects that he's also been working on for more than a decade is about one strand of our Unitarian Universalist forebears, the 19th century transcendentalists, Thoreau, Emerson, Margaret Fulham, who challenged the religious establishment of their day with the insight that spiritual death was much more about the here, the now, and nature than it is about antiquated notions that, that holiness can only be found in the past or only in official holy times and places. As we will hear later during the offertory, the transcendentalists challenged us that everything is holy now. And that insight deeply resonates as well with the universalist half of our UU heritage, which has evolved from a focus on universal salvation for all in the next world to a universal call to love the hell out of this world here and now. In contrast, the history of spirituality has often been an emphasis that the sacred can only be found in certain people, like priests, only in certain holy places that were often cordoned off, and only at certain times, special holy places. Days. And while we should recognize and honor that there are particularly sacred and holy times and places, it's also vital to claim the sacredness of ordinary life. Laura talked about this a little with seeing the ordinariness of just a bowl and a spoon. Or gratitude just for being able to take a shower. Feel free to move. I see some of you uh, being blinded by the sunlight. Feel free to move at any time that you need to. 
Again, the history of most spiritual traditions have, has emphasized the opposite of ordinary holiness. They have emphasized the, the, the superiority of a professional holy class. That Christian or Buddhist monks, Hindu gurus, and Jewish men who spend all day studying the Torah, that those are people who achieve holiness on a level that is unable to be touched by those of us ordinary folk. But increasingly, that orthodoxy is being questioned. On one hand, mountaintop monastics who spend all their time in a cloistered religious setting, they do legitimately have valuable insights to be able to offer us, and they can benefit those of us who find ourselves crazy busy a lot more than maybe we'd like. On the other hand, many regular folks have been wounded over the years, perhaps some of you have been wounded over the years, by monastics who with little to no experience in the secular world have nevertheless felt it was their duty to issue decrees from on high about how all of humanity should live, decrees that were often unrealistic unless you live in a retreat setting with no family obligations, with financial support, as free will donations from all those people that you're criticizing who spend their days working. Indeed, the more difficult and important spiritual challenge of our time may be cultivating a greater appreciation for the sacredness of ordinary life lived well. For example, in Buddhism, one of the gold standards is going on a three-year retreat. Not a three-day retreat, not a three-week or three-month retreat, a three-year retreat. And as powerful as those experiences surely are, and as people testify that they are, for most people, a three-year retreat will never be anything like a realistic option. Instead, the much more important task is integrating the wisdom of the world's religions right now into your everyday life. Whatever your path, I invite you to consider that even more important than your experience during spiritual practice is whether the fruit of your practice is borne out in your everyday life. While I care about whether you experience the sacred during your spiritual practice, I'm even more interested in how your spiritual practice helps you feel more connected to yourself, more connected to others, more deeply connected to this world throughout the day. Whether your spiritual pr practice helps you be a better, more grounded coworker, partner, and parent, not just during the four minutes, theoretically, you're like, I'm really a better, you know, parent when I'm in the midst of doing yoga, or I'm really a better, you know, coworker when I'm on my meditation mat, theoretically, right? No, does it actually change and make you more centered throughout the day? If it doesn't, you might be doing your spiritual practice wrong, I and mean, we, can, we can talk about that. Because the point is transforming how we experience the ordinary. You can know that you are on the right track in your spiritual practice if, in the words of the Christian tradition, you increasingly see more love, more joy, more peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life. Or if, in the words of the Buddhist tradition, you see more generosity, renunciation, wisdom, strength, effort, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity in your daily life. The point of religion is not only some form of quantum spirituality that seeks to solve the mysteries of metaphysics. It's also quotidian spirituality, integrating the wisdom of the world's religions into the everyday, the commonplace, the ordinary. As the spiritual teacher Henry Nouwen writes in a paragraph that seems as relevant as ever in light of recent headlines, not too long ago, a priest told me that he canceled his subscription to the New York Times because he felt that the endless stories of war, crime, power games, political manipulations, they only disturbed his mind and heart and prevented him from meditation and prayer. That's a sad story because it suggests that only by denying the world can you live in it. And that only by surrounding yourself by an artificial, self-induced quietude can you live a spiritual life. A real spiritual life does exactly the opposite. It makes you so alert and aware of the world around you that all that is happening or would ever happen to us becomes part of our contemplation and our meditation and invites us to a free and a fearless response.
as follows. In a world feel, filled with fear-mongering and demagoguery, now it reminds us of the hope that through spiritual practice, whichever spiritual practice and tradition you are drawn to, we might become more contemplative, more grounded, more centered, such that whatever comes, we bring a free and a fearless response. At the same time, I don't intend to imply that we're talking about some kind of free and fearless response that's a one-time act of heroism. The invitation is more to see ever more fully the sacred in every moment, each, every day, ordinary moment. As Kathleen Norris writes in her book, The Quotidian Mysteries, the ordinary activities I find most compatible with contemplation for me are walking, baking bread, and doing laundry. As the song Scarlet sang during the prelude says, to pray as only laundry can. Or as the 8th century Muslim Sufi mystic Rabia of Basra said, it helps putting my hands on a pot. So instead of just going to the prayer mat, he said, it helps putting my hands on a pot, on a broom or in a washing pail. And I tried painting, but it was easiest to fly slicing potatoes. Along these lines, one of my favorite books on ordinary spirituality is Jack Cornfield's After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. And that's where he went around and interviewed some Zen masters and other meditation experts, but he also interviewed their like spouse and kids. Uh, you know, not just how they are in retreat settings, but how they are in the grocery store and uh, things like that. Because religion is as much about the mundane as the mountaintop. In Cornfield's words, we all know that after the honeymoon, comes the marriage. After the election comes the hard task of governance. In the spiritual life, it's the same. After the ecstasy comes the laundry. And it is understandable to want a great honeymoon, to win the election, to have a powerful, profound spiritual encounter. But who cares about a great honeymoon when the marriage is falling apart? Who cares about a landslide election if the government has become corrupt and inept? Who cares about a passing moment of spiritual rapture on a meditation cushion on a beautiful mountaintop if you can't in integrate those insights into treating others every day with more humility, more compassion, and more kindness? The mountaintop moments will always be fleeting. The invitation is to see the ordinary moments as sacred too. As we reflect on our ordinary lives, poet Jean Valentin says, Blessed are those who remember that what they now have, they once longed for. You may not have everything you want, you probably never will, but blessed are they who remember that what they now have, what you already have, you once longed for. In that spirit, to share only one of many interviews from Cornfield's book, one woman says, as a young Catholic, I was inspired by the saints. I have always wanted to do things like Mother, Mother Teresa's work in India. But most of my life has not been so glamorous. Not that Mother Teresa's life is exactly glamorous, but anyway, set that aside. After college, I became a teacher in an elementary school. But then my mother had a stroke, and I had to drop out of teaching and help her for two years. Bathe her care for her bed sores, cook, pay the bills, run the house. At times, I wanted to complete those responsibilities and get back to my spiritual life. And then one morning, it dawned on me. I was doing the work of Mother Teresa, and I was doing it in my own house. That's real spirituality. That ordinary spirituality that is equally or more demanding, challenging, profound than anything you will ever experience on a mountaintop retreat. It's like the old, old saying that children are like little Zen masters. They're pushing your buttons every bit as much as a Zen master would. So those are invitations to practice ordinary spirituality. As you use, we often say that we believe in deeds, not creeds. So allow me to conclude with some lyrics from that same Quaker singer-songwriter, Carrie Newcomer, that was in our prelude with the song, Holy as the Day is Spent. This is from her song, I Believe. As I read them, I invite you to think about what 
parts of ordinary spirituality do you believe in? For her part, newcomer begins, I believe in a good, strong cup of ginger tea. And I believe that these shoots and these roots will become a tree. How like Linklater's boyhood in the Before Trilogy is that? Knowing that over time, these shoots and roots are going to become a tree and being able to witness that process. Newcomer continues, all I know is I can't help but see all of this as so very holy. I believe in jars of jelly put up by careful hands, and I believe that most folks are doing about the best they can. I believe in a good long letter written with real paper and with real pen, and I believe in the ones I love and that I'll never see again. I believe in the kindness of strangers and in the comfort of old friends. And I know that I get scared sometimes, but that all I need is here. And all I know is I can't help but see all of this as so very holy. I invite you to take just a few moments, allow your head to descend into your heart, Allow yourself to maybe be surprised with what emerges for you as to what are moments of ordinary spirituality for you. In a few moments, we'll have a chance to share. 